went to ask him what happened, made a call, asked him to call me back. And you know what the Judge Figueroa did? A few days later, he jumps off the parking lot ramp to his death. But he didn't die right away. They took him to the hospital, and he laid in agony for hours. Um, I think, you know, when you have, I think God's working here is what I'm trying to say, Mrs. Solomon. Yes. I think when, when God sees, you know, I'm not saying your daughter is a saint and she never did anything wrong in her life. I'm not, not trying to paint that kind of picture, but certainly in this situation, she was a victim of a planned assassination. That's pretty clear to me. Um, there was another case. Uh, William Christopher was held in jail for six years with no trial at all. They would not give him a trial. They just kept him locked up and said, take a plea bargain, take a plea bargain. You'll be out today, take a plea bargain. And he said, you want me to lie, and I won't lie. So well, you just sit in jail. And they kept getting to extend his time. He kept saying, well, I'll get an honest attorney somewhere. I'll come along. Never did. Finally, I got involved in the case, did an in-jail interview. And I remember when the judge, who at first had not wanted to let my camera in the courtroom, and now they put on a new prosecutor, and this prosecutor's name was Max. Max calls me up and said, Mr. Wagner, uh, he won't take a plea bargain unless you uh, come to court and tape it. And, the, and I said, well, the judge won't let me. I've already gone that route. He said, no, the judge said you can bring your camera in court. Just you can tape it because it's the only way he'll do this deal. I said, well, that's a real change. When I got in there and started taping, I didn't realize they'd pulled a fast one. I was too busy concentrating. And what the judge had said... He said, you can call. I'm going to let you out of jail today. And the reason was, he had served as much time as they could give him if he'd been convicted. They couldn't keep him in jail any, any longer. longer. So what they were going to do is declare him mentally insane and send him to a mental hospital for the rest of his life, life if he didn't take this deal. And he looked at me and he said, should I take the deal, Mr. Wagner? And I just looked up and said, you know, you've sat in jail for six years I can't make this decision for you. But I had a gal who was a CASA, a court-appointed special advocate. Her name was, um, <laughs> forgive me, Adrian, Adrian Ashley. And she was also taping this and working in a documentary for uh, uh, HBO. And she went and sat next to him and said, take the deal. Take the deal. Even though you've refused to take the deal, take it today because Mr. Wagner's here. And what I noticed is when the judge read and said, okay, you can bring, send any evidence you want, but you can't subpoena the, the baby doctor or any of his records. And that was the key. He was the only one that could testify his wife had no bruises, never had any bruises. He was a court reporter, mandated reporter. He would have had to call the cops. And the whole thing was she, his, his wife was a little bit loony. Uh, she was from the Philippines. She, she was a drama queen. She had accused him of beating her, and she had bruises up and down her body. Well, she had no bruises, because he sent me photos. He took photos of her, because he was so pregnant. You know, he's proud of his wife being pregnant. He had pregnant pictures of her front, backside, completely nude. Yeah. Every week, he took new pictures, because he was so happy. He was having a boy, his first boy. And he was also an Army veteran, and he was like 40, and he's having his first son. There was not a bruise on her. And that's what the doctor would have had to testify. And I didn't notice that until I got back from San Jose, California, and I'm watching my own videotape, getting ready to do a TV show about it. And the judge said, I will decide this case in 90 days. And I remember when the judge said that, I, there was lots of lights in the room, you know, it's a courtroom. But I seemed to see like a dark shadow around the judge. Honest, my, Mr. Bishop's chuckling. He thinks, you know, I'm seeing things. But I'm telling you the truth. When the judge said that with such arrogance, I will decide this in 90 days. Even though there were lights, it seemed to be like a darkness around the judge. The next week, the judge came down with a fast-acting cancer, and within two months, he was dead. He never got to decide nothing. Anything. He should have asked God what he should decide. And if I don't know what they ever did decide. I think they appointed another judge and probably found him guilty, but they told him, you're not going to do any more jail time. We're going to let you out today, and, and we're going to just... If we find you guilty, if, you know, if we find you guilty, you've served all the time you're going to serve. And you don't even have to come back for the trial. And they let him out. I don't know what happened to Mr. Christopher. He's probably living in the boonies somewhere today. 
But that judge died. And that really, you know, said to me, there is a God. He is watching. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know if God's black, white, or has no skin color. Maybe his, his color is just love. Maybe right. God's color is just love. And he saw the arrogance and the hate that this judge and this legal system had done to this innocent man. And they said, we're going to fix this. And God fixed it. That judge wasn't around 90 days later. Right. <laughs> he should have asked God. Because none of us are guaranteed. I mean, I could walk That's out of the right. studio, right. a cop shoot me and say, oh, I shot the wrong guy. Was that Mr. Wagner? Exactly. Oh, well. <laughs> None of us are guaranteed one more day in this world, and God's in control. So I am, I am really sorry this happened to you. You had some other things you wanted to tell us, I think, about this circumstance of this trial. You, were, you had an operation or something you needed to do, and, and the day the verdict comes in, you're yeah, not there. I wasn't there. I missed the verdict, oh, my God, and I had to hear it over the telephone. So that was, that was totally devastating, too, because I had been there for support to my children. I had been there because I needed to have the knowledge for myself to see and to hear all the testimony myself. And then the very day that it actually took place, I wasn't there. So I was at the doctor's office. I missed the whole thing. Don't beat yourself up. Missed the whole thing. Don't beat yourself up, Mrs. Solomon. God has still got a hand in this. And uh, like I did, I told you I prayed for you, and I did pray for you, and I'll continue praying for you. And I ask you people. I ask you out there, if there are any believers, whether you believe in Allah or you believe in God of the Old Testament, or you believe in Jesus Christ, I ask you to pray in truth and righteousness that justice be done, that this young woman, who's now got a permanent muscle damage, that she get compensated and that she is protected and these cops don't hire some Mexican gang to try to uh, snuff her or get rid of her brother in jail before his retrial or appeal can be heard because I hope you do get a retrial. I'm sure if you get a good appellate. Oh, I think you should tell people that you're not terribly wealthy and that's why you didn't put up bail. What was your daughter's bail? Uh, my daughter and son, original, the original charges was attempted murder because they heard a shot. They assumed that shot came from the weapon they found so they automatically gave attempted murder. And I want to say within the year of $587,000, Mark Zimmerman would have loved to, uh, he walked away with a hundred and something thousand, $587,000. And then eventually they came down to $169,000. So it was something that was out of our- Still out of reach. Out of reach, we were not able to afford that at all. We got the $169,000 bail after a year's time. So we went through a whole year, approximately 11 months or so to a year of the first proceedings. The, ch the charges were dropped and refiled the very same day. And then we went the next four months into the next, uh, where, the tr where the amount of bail was dropped to $169,000. And then down to, $69,000, but trial was about to start, and we were in need of an attorney at that point. So you had to spend the money on the attorney? We had to spend the money on the attorney. So there's one kind of justice for people who can afford bail. There's a different kind of justice for those that can't afford bail. I don't think trials are meant to go on this long. I think this, the solution is to get back to common law, grand juries. This sounds like this was done with uh, not a, a grand jury indictment. No, this was just a... An information based on lies, based on a gun that mysteriously appears with no shots fired, but that's what, the, that's what they used to charge her with attempted murder. Attempted, uh, attempted murder, the charges were uh, uh, dropped after that for attempted murder and they went to assault with a semi-automatic weapon. So when they realized the gun had not been fired, the charges were dropped to uh, assault with a semi-automatic weapon, then the bill was reduced to $169,000, or around about that area somewhere. And then later on, when we went to the second prelim, it was dropped to $69,000 for one and $89,000 for the other. You couldn't afford either one. Uh, of them. We couldn't afford either one. We had a we ha had no choice. We had a public defender that had been assigned to Neosha who was insisting that we plead guilty, that we 
And here we are now and after pain and being able to provide Neosha with an attorney, we have Neosha out and we're still fighting for Joshua. And we still have to pay for an appeal. For Say it again, we still, we still have to pay for an appeal for Joshua. For Joshua. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's the tragedy is not over. But I look at that and I say, those cops didn't just happen to position themselves right there. Yeah. They were waiting to do an assassin's job. And it, that whole thing to me just looks... Uh, smells. That just, that just smells. Uh, those are dangerous policemen with a gun. And you're in the city here about a year ago. I believe, if you can believe what's said in the newspaper and the media, you know, two, two uniform cops shot to death another uniform cop in their black and whites, from their black and whites, in this city. And the mayor said, we're going to have a private news conference. Mr. Wagner's not invited. <laughs> Only approved media, you know, and, and then it's very short and no questions. And I don't believe they've released a police report yet, and it's been over a year. Now, they say, you know, this cop that died was doing something he shouldn't have been doing with an underage 17 and a half year old girl or something. I don't know if that's true. And until you can get the police report and see, you know, oh, everything's going into a closet. We don't have transparency anymore. To me, that should have all been within two months. It should have all been open and public because I would like to go investigate that. And that happened right here in Santa Maria the same town where seven years ago, on June 13th of 05, Michael Jackson, after being ruthlessly, ruthlessly, maliciously, with malice aforethought, prosecuted in open court for five months, was found not guilty of not just the 10 felonies, but 14 charges. And it was mostly an all-white jury. And they said, this is all crap. I remember the Italian film crew left, I think, one month. I think they left in March, early March. And they said, I said, why are you guys packing up? Said, oh, this is all crap. I said, well, thank you. I'm glad there's somebody who agrees with me because I'd watched enough of the trial already. I said, these, these people are liars and grifters. And if, if the jury can't see this, then God help us all. In your case, what did the jury look like? I mean, I don't like to be racial, but was it were there half blacks on that jury? Or? Well, out of 65, I counted six blacks from the very start that was uh, before the jury picking. Uh, during the jury picking, there was one black that sat on the jury out of the 12 seats. and um, Only one? There was one black. One black. One black. One black that sat on the seat. And you live in a mostly black neighborhood. Correct. In a highly black city of Los Angeles with lots of... It's black not like blacks are scarce and hard to find in Los Angeles. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and only one makes it through to the jury pool? One. We had one jury, one black juror on the, on the jury seat. On the jury. And um, the rest of the mix-up out of maybe two uh, Asians were Hispanics and uh, Caucasians. So, so I would say the most of what was there was Hispanics. And in the, how many of the uh, prosecutor's friends made it to get on the jury? Do you know well, not the prosecutor that was prosecuting the case. They were friends of background people of prosecutors. Or Other friends. prosecutors. Yes. Yes. They were or, from the prosecutor club. Yeah, our friends. Uh, we even oh had a lady God. on the jury on, uh, in the jury pool who actually worked in the court building. We had a lady who was um, a legal secretary. So we had all these people. And then we had people from cities that were all around that weren't even of Los Angeles City. So I, I, me personally, didn't feel that that was a juror of our peers who live in Los Angeles, who know the culture of Los Angeles, who knows what goes on in Los Angeles, who should be yeah. judging what takes place in Los Angeles by the way the culture is and how they live in the city. Right. I, yeah, I agree with you. I don't live there anymore. I did live there seven years, and uh, I agree with you. And I was actually called to a federal grand jury uh, or federal trial service paid really well and over a hundred and some dollars a day for me to leave Santa Maria and go down there 
And I sat there, I don't know how many weeks, and I got to thinking, something's wrong if they got to bring jurors from Santa Maria, two counties away, down to Los Angeles. Like, there's nobody in Los Angeles that's unemployed and might want to sit right. on a jury. Exactly. <laughs> you got to grab people from way up here, and, and I guess one juror was brought down from uh, Atascadero, which is like 200 miles from Los Angeles. And they were paying them buku money, and all we did is sit in the jury pool room waiting and waiting. And that room had probably two, 300 people in there every day. Well, it was the strangest thing. As soon as the jury started to be picked, the prosecutor, as, as each black juror came, prospective juror came and sat in the box, he removed them. That was his choice to remove. It appeared clearly to me and hopefully to everyone else who wanted to be fair in the courtroom, that he was intentionally removing the black jurors. And to me, it said to, to me that if you're black, you can't fairly represent Los Angeles and be a juror because your opinion would not be representative of being fair. Yeah. And so they were being removed immediately. Immediately. Let me ask your daughter, you sat in this jail for over a year. Yes. Did you, you know, have situations that were embarrassing in there? Yes, a lot of situations. The officers, they strip search you. They undress you, all of your clothes. They throw your clothes on the floor. They make you bend over and they check you. I hope yeah. these were at least female officers. They were female officers, but just the whole procedure was embarrassing. It was degrading. I just... It just was ridiculous. And you'd been convicted of nothing, and you're strip searched how many times? Every once a month? Or? Every time I went to court, every time I left the facility, I would be strip searched. Oh my goodness. So 15 days of trial, 15 times they went through this. Even before trial, back and forth to court, that to the prelims, and all of that, I was being strip searched every time I came back to the facility. I hope you win a large award. I hope you get the right attorney who won't sell you out like, what's his name, Dale, who sold out the Maropolis case. And that was, that was upsetting to me because this attorney that brought the civil case in federal court, Judge Hunter's court in downtown L.A., and Judge Hunter's a black judge, and I thought, oh, the black judge will give these people some justice. He didn't give me any justice. He, he excluded the deathbed, the equivalent of a deathbed confession because that kid after he made that phone call and was recorded, was shot dead in a gas station uh, by somebody in a black and white. And then the tape of that disappeared after the police got it. We never saw that tape. And he just let that all slide by. And this poor family, they lost two little toddlers, Rachel and Joey, that never made it to be old enough to go to school. They died from smoke inhalation from what the Miraculous family testified to set by this, uh, and I can't even remember this miserable creature who's on the L.A. Detectives Department now. And I have a video of him as he left the courtroom. It's on my YouTube channel. Asked him if he wanted to make a statement as he crossed the intersection there, right across from the uh, county criminal building, Kinney Corner from there. Anyway, I just could not believe what went on. And then on top of that, uh, I want to ask you more, but I, I got to say this. Judge Hunter tells me, tells a bailiff in the federal court, he said, I, at first I said, can I put my camera in? They said, no, no camera. And they published it. So all the lawyers knew I wanted to put a camera in that courtroom. He published it on the Internet. Wagner submitted a media request, answers, and then I get the answer, no, you can't. So then I, I'm sitting, I'm taking notes. And the bailiff comes over and says, no note-taking. Judge Hunter says, you can't take notes. What? There's nobody else watching this trial but me. Every seat is empty, except for me. Like, who am I disturbing by just taking notes? Right. That was, it is so clear, justice has left this country. And that's why this gal gets strip searched, this young lady gets shot in the back of her leg, falsely accused, set up, and now she has to go begging for an attorney that will represent her, and you probably got no money left. You spent it all on the first attorneys. That's correct. Is the NAACP going to come forward and put up some money and help you? 
Well, I doubt that. I doubt that. We've had um, um, a, a quite a time trying to get that kind of representation. And I think that most organizations want to have a clear-cut view. They're going to walk in and get some kind of recognition for themselves and not actually have to defend. So we haven't had that kind of representation as far as um, civil rights or NAACP. And I think this is a case Susan you could do miracles with. If you could just get a hold of her. Um, if you could just get a hold of her. Tell me what else happened. Did you get threatened or bullied by any of the other women in there? It was a lot of bad. I wouldn't get any medical attention. Um, I developed a tumor in my breast while I was in there, and I wasn't getting the proper medical attention. I had to have the judge order me medical attention, and they still wouldn't acknowledge his order, and he had to order it a couple of times more for them to finally acknowledge it. And it didn't really get acknowledged till right before trial started. Wow. So it was poor medical attention. Did you ever get the tumor taken care of? No. You still have the tumor? Yes. And now you're too broke to do anything about it. Well, we have the tumor now, and now we have the opportunity to go and look into it. So while she was there, the judge ordered that the next time she comes back to court that they have a medical record for him to be able to see that she had been to see the uh, doctor. So then they took her and they did a biopsy of it. So now that she's home, we'll go and f do the follow-up to make sure that it's, it's benign and, and it's not going to um, interfere oh greatly with her health. Are there any doctors out there? Are there any doctors that could step in and volunteer to help here? I mean, the injustice of this, I mean, just the stress of being locked up could, could start a tumor. Yes. People get stressed and depressed. Were you depressed while you were in there? Depressed. Yes, depressed. It was the most worst experience in my life. I had been previously shot and right from being shot right to being incarcerated for something that I didn't do. Just walking to a bus station. Oh, my God. I'm going to go now to uh, another clip. Uh, this time of year, I like to remember Bob Berg, who was the only witness for a man who was murdered in the jail, in the infamous jail in New Hampshire. Bob Berg died about a year after this. He flew out to California from New England to do this interview, believing, falsely believing, that the Attorney General of New Hampshire would investigate this infamous Valley Street jail where a lot of people have been killed in the jail by the jailers. And to my knowledge, not one of those jailers has ever been prosecuted, including the murderers of Brian Armstrong, an unemployed 41-year-old welder who was in jail for being unable to pay child support. And there, he gets his head cracked open like a watermelon hitting the concrete floor. We'll go to that and be back again with more of Mrs. Solomon and her daughter. We ready? Failure to appear in a court for a rearage he couldn't pay. Correct. And did he ever get to see that judge? Or was he dead before well, he actually got to the Well, uh, coincidentally... Uh, I'm just trying to get the, the sequence of events yes. of how he got to be in the situation where his head splatters like a watermelon. <clears throat> he, he was... Uh, a, a warrant was issued for his arrest. Apparently, apparently, a warrant was issued for his arrest. I have seen the warrant, uh, and the warrant was for his failure to appear at a court hearing <clears throat> for non-support. So he was apprehended by the sheriff under that warrant, and then held uh, over until the hearing on his reasons for, or and the cause for non-payment non of child support. Okay. Now, it's coincidental that we both went before the same judge on the same day. Oh, really? And there are actual court documents that bear both of our names that show we were heard by Judge Bernard Hamsey. Judge Hamsey saw you both. And how did, did you hear what was said to Brian Armstrong by the no, judge? No, I was not uh, in the courtroom other than for my own hearing, so I have no, no you didn't idea. You pay attention. I wasn't even in the courtroom. Okay, you weren't in the courtroom. What I find interesting is the state of New Hampshire's Office 
of the chief medical examiner dated here uh, January 18th as the date of death, the year 2000. So it's been over three years and there's been no resolution. Even though you saw the guard grab this guy and then toss Armstrong back, you heard his head, as you said it, break like a watermelon splattering. And crack this, splat type of thing. Yeah, sort of a, a crack and a splat. And I'm going to page nine of the autopsy and the cause of death says blunt impact injury of head with cerebral contusions, contusional her hematomas, cerebral edema, and herniation. Contributing conditions, chronic alcoholism with cirrhosis of the liver. Contrib that's a contributing condition. Manner of death, it says very clearly, I don't know if the camera can zoom in tight enough to get it. Manner of death, according to the state report, is homicide. Homicide in the jail. And it doesn't say who did the homicide. But on the following page, it shows the injuries of Brian Armstrong, uh, whose date of birth is September 30th, 1958. And he was age 41 at the time of death three years ago. And it shows, you know, like injuries and, and scars. There's a lot of scars, but it shows some injuries to the head, scar on the front of the head, uh, things on the back, blue red, uh, just above the right side of the buttocks here. I mean, it looks like somebody did a little more to him than just falling back. Is it possible, Bob, that? they may have done something to him when you weren't in the jail or that you weren't there or something happened the day before or something you didn't see? Uh, that there uh, might have been an ongoing... Clear, clear, clearly I have no knowledge of anything prior to what I observed. Um, but... Uh, but he was in the jail. After, after, after he hit the floor, there uh, was a panic alarm sounded by one of the two guards. Okay. Which caused an, a... a uh, entry into the pod of approximately uh, a dozen uh, other jailers who surrounded his uh, prone body on the floor. And uh, uh, it kind of resembled a scrimmage uh, contest around the body. Now, I don't know whether they were, they were kicking him or if they were uh, punching him, but it was not what I would call a benign a group of uh, jailers uh, standing around the body on the floor. Did you actually see any jailer kick him? I saw foot movements that I could interpret in that capacity, but they were not like uh, hauling off and kicking a football. It was more like, like maybe uh, kind of probing Trotting. your cat to get off the uh, <laughs> off the couch with your, your with your foot. So they were. But one can't tell from a distance of 50 feet what the force was of the foot action, but there was considerable action. Well. Um Clearly, the number one finding here was a blunt impact injury to the head, which is consistent with what you observed, according to that, the coroner's report. And that's, that, that stunned me when the family gave me a copy of the, of the uh, homicide report, because at, at that point, that was a, the connection. When I saw the hom homicide report, and the fact that it stated uh, he died of a, of a head injury on the back of the head, that certainly matched exactly what I observed uh, this inmate suffer when he was launched by a guard. It also says there was chronic alcoholism, a cirrhosis of the liver, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, and third thing was a right lower lobe had pneumonia. And if he had pneumonia, I think it would have been possible he might have had sinus infections as well. I wouldn't know that. Uh, well, I, I, I just, I'm not a medical expert. I've so. talked, I know, I know a lot of doctors, and uh, it's not uncommon if you've got pneumonia to have sinus problems, which would interfere with Armstrong's hearing. So even though the guard may have been shouting at him, Armstrong may have been struggling to hear what he was saying. And based on what you just testified to, that he just continued to walk calmly up, wasn't shouting at the guard, it would seem like a very plausible event. Armstrong still couldn't hear. The guy was shouting at him. And the guy didn't understand Armstrong's medical condition. Does that seem like going too far-fetched, or does that, does that fit the the picture that you remember. I've never uh, thought of that or considered it. Um, to me, it, it, it struck me that Armstrong was walking out because he had something to say to a guard. Uh, it could have been important. Uh, I have no idea what importance it might be. I mean, there could be any number of reasons, like 
gee, I don't have any toilet paper in my cell. I got to take crap. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, that could have been something, could have been as, something as, as trivial as, and yeah. benign as that. I have no idea why he was walking out. Well, that was Bob Berg, an interview I did back nine years ago. Bob Berg died the next year. Uh, he was in jail for simply being unable or unwilling to pay his child support. Didn't do any good to throw him in jail. His son, at the time, I think was 22 or 23, and he was making an argument. At 23, I shouldn't have to keep paying his college bills. I mean, uh, when do you cut the cord? But while he was in jail, he saw them kick Brian Armstrong, who never appeared in that clip, watched him kick him to death. Now, the cop said, oh, he fell backward and cracked his head open. But as you saw in the diagram, he had bruises up and down his legs, in the, in the back, in the front, in the side, in the neck. He was kicked to death. And that's what Bob eventually testifies to. But he's a mathematician, and he takes a long time writing out his formula, getting it out to, to get to the punchline. And that's what I'm glad didn't happen to this young lady, that she didn't get kicked to death or beat to death. And I would just ask you people, call the district attorney of Los Angeles. His name again is what? Marakic. 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 Call assistant DA Marakic and ask him what the flying frigging singing monkey is he doing prosecuting this person with this kind of crummy evidence. It seems he's committing a crime. Civil rights are being violated here by the police and covered up by the uh, Los Angeles DA, which I saw in the murder of Michael Jackson in the Conrad Murray trial. And I knew when they postponed that for one year, Conrad Murray would never serve one day, and I said this publicly, and you heard me,